Debbie Issa, the floor is yours. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here, um, and this is, is really a terrific opportunity um, to share with you the findings of the World Development Report of 2017 on governance and the law. Um, the report was launched at the end of January, and we've since then been going on a bit of a world tour to try to um, talk about the report. And it's, it's wonderful to be at this particular event because I think the context um, and the issues that you're looking at are so relevant for this report. Um, so the World Development Report this year, um, as you may know, there's, there's a different topic every year. Um, this year, it's about how to promote policies that can effectively promote security, growth, and equity. So that's a pretty ambitious topic, right? It covers pretty much everything we do in development. Uh, but the main focus of this report is not what are the right policies to achieve that aim. We have a wealth of expertise and knowledge um, about what policies, laws, and mechanisms are needed at any given point uh, in a country's trajectory to achieve development outcomes. But what the report focuses on is why, even if we know technically what is the right answer, why is it that these policies either don't get adopted, um, or they get adopted but they don't get implemented, or they get implemented and they lead to perverse consequences. So what this report tries to do is really move beyond what policies should be chosen to understanding how policies are chosen and how they are implemented. Now. I think I'm going to have the same problem here as Lant. Bear with me. Could I get some help on the... <laughs> oh, there we go. Okay. Um, so just to talk quickly about the motivation for the report, what are the kinds of questions that we're trying to answer? So three pretty common scenarios um, that I think we'll all recognize. The first, why do ineffective policies persist? So the example that we use here, um, is energy subsidies. We know that these are aggressive. We know they induce inefficient energy use. And yet, uh, we know that they're very hard to get rid of. Yeah? Okay, thank you. Sorry about that. Okay, secondly, why are good policies not adopted or implemented? So, for example, education. It's well known that teacher absenteeism reduces student learning. We know that this is a problem. We have all kinds of different technical solutions that we've tried, different kinds of contract systems and, all, and incentives, and yet what works in one country often does not work in another country. And then, why is it that solutions that are not first best from an economic or technical perspective actually get results? So the example we have here is, as we know, the Kyoto Agreement um, for climate change crafted, technically crafted quotas, um, you know, that, that seemed to be the best policy efficiency-wise, but, but it didn't work. The Paris Agreement, by contrast, had a system of voluntary commitments, which is maybe not best from a, from a technical perspective, and yet it seemed to work better, at, le at least for now. I'll make apologies for my own country later. <laughs> so this report argues This report argues that commonly when we see these sorts of problems, we see that policies are not adopted or not implemented, there are, there are three easy answers that we tend to put forward all the time. We say that the policies fail because they weren't the right policies. They didn't follow best practice. Or we say the policies failed because there wasn't sufficient capacity to implement them. That we talked about that this morning. Or we say that policies failed because of a lack of political will. Um, and what we argue is these are two simple answers. It's not enough. We need to go much deeper to understand why is it that something works in one country but not another? What are the conditions that enable that? Why is it that capacity is not invested in? And often we see, we call it a capacity problem, but actually there's, there's no shortage of educated people and technically capable people. The problem is that they don't have the environment, the enabling environment, in order to turn their capacity into capability. And then third, the lack of political will, well, what does that mean? We need to unpack that and say, what are the incentives? What are the underlying incentives and structures that are shaping that political will? So a word about policy effectiveness. This report is looking at, we define policy effectiveness in terms of their ability to achieve three outcomes, security, growth, and equity. And this is where we put sort of the normative perspective. So we, when we talk about effectiveness and what we're looking for, it's the ability to achieve outcomes related to these three areas, and why we assume that most countries, all countries, um, 
at least will say that, you know, and share in principle, um, that they want to keep their people free from violence, they want to uh, promote growth and prosperity, and they want to share that prosperity and create equity. So now what is it that, is, that, that makes it different from one to another? Now we know um, that the literature, of course, points to institutions, and I'm doing the Lant thing in terms of institutions, um, as the main determinant of policy effectiveness. But as Lant said uh, very eloquently this morning, institutions refer to these abstract entities that evolve over time. So think, we've, you know, why nations fail, Asimoglu and Robinson, North Wallace and Weingast. We have to go over centuries to kind of understand what happened and how institutions get from extractive institutions or from natural orders to inclusive institutions or open order societies. So we're, the World Bank is, after all, development practitioners. We're not here to wait hundreds of years. We have to think, well, how do we understand what's going on now? Um, so, we also know, and another thing I can say quickly, because Lant had a graph on this before, we know that certain kinds of institutions correlate with non-oil dependent high income countries. And we know that certain kind of institutions correlate with bottom of the barrel. Um, but in between, there's a vast amount of heterogeneity. And so what we want to understand is how is it that different trajectories can lead to development outcomes. So the approach that this report takes is to move beyond this concept of institutions to focus on actors, actors that bargain to reach and sustain agreements. So we define governance not as government. We don't define governance as the way a lot of development partners do in terms of public financial management and uh, civil service reform and things like that. We define governance as the process through which actors um, bargain over how, for any given issue, how rights, resources, and responsibilities are to be allocated, and how that bargain that is struck is then sustained. So three concepts for our definition of governance. Number one, actors. Who are these actors? The actors may be state actors, they may be non-state actors. This report takes a very positivist approach to understanding what, what does it actually look like, as opposed to what, what do we think things should look like. So, um, you, you know, you'll have state actors around the table, you'll have business actors, you'll have religious interests, you'll have all kinds of different things depending on any given situation. Later I'll show you a slide on this. Secondly, what is, where does this bargaining take place? What do we mean by, um, you know, th this bargaining arena? We call it the policy arena. And there's no single arena in any country. The process of making bargains happens at different levels. It can be at a national level, at a local level, often transnational, um, what depends is where is it that the, the actors with power to make decisions actually are? Where is that space um, that is capable of determining policy around any given issue? Um, and depending on the issue, they will involve different sets of actors. And then what the rules? I'm going to use rules, I think, a little bit differently than Lant did because I'll use rules both in terms of formal rules that are laws and rules that are informal as well, which can, can refer to any number of things from informal deals um, to social norms to other kind of informal practices. So what governs the rules of the policy arena is usually often a mix of formal rules. Um, at the highest level, you'll have the constitution that kind of determines what the rules are, who has power um, and who does not, um, and a mix of social norms, informal networks, backroom deals, and the like. Now, the first Sorry. You're right, you have to be very patient with this. Okay, so the first um, main message of the report is to say that what we really need to do um, in trying to improve policy effectiveness is, function, is, fo is focus on function rather than form. So I'm gonna start by talking about law for a minute, but then law is sort of a segue into talking about what we mean by function versus form. So we often talk about the rule of law, which most basically is a system where clear laws are enforced in predictable ways that bind citizens and government alike, and how important it is to enable development by allowing clear expectations, a level playing field, and a constraint on the abuse of power. But again, this isn't linear, and this doesn't get plopped down from heaven. It certainly doesn't get plopped over from development actors. So where does this come from? And just to quote Gordon Brown, when it comes to the rule of law, it's the first five centuries that count. So instead of focusing on the rule of law and just reinforcing the fact that it's a good thing to have. Um, what this report tries to look at is the role of law. Every society uses law in various ways. Um, law is a critical tool of governments and of development partners. It's used to codify policies and make them binding. 
we call this law ordering behavior. It's used to shape the policy arena and enable or constrain power. And it's used as a tool of contestation against that power. But we also know that more often than not, as was discussed at length this morning, um, what is written on paper in law and what happens in reality, there's a huge gap. Um, there's a big implementation gap um, between that is and what, you know, if you could see on the, um, on the right side uh, of the slide here, this is just an example to show um, countries that adopted gender quotas. Um, and what you have is the dot on the left side is the year that they adopted it, and the dot on the right side is when they actually implemented it. So the first one there is Bangladesh. It took them a good 40 years. Um, the next one is South Korea. It has yet to implement it. This is just one of many, many examples that you could, you could put about um, how it is that laws on paper do not necessarily translate immediately into, into reality. So what, what we try to do is unpack law and two important things um, about this that I want to emphasize. One, law, as in state law, formal law, um, does not operate in a vacuum. It is one of multiple normative systems. We can call them, and socio-legal scholars argue all the time about what is law, what is a social norm, what is other things, but the fact is that law is one among, among many other things that are competing to actually order people's behavior. And those things might include customary law, they might include international law and treaties. They might include private law and contract law. They might include social norms. Um, and so law at any given time is interacting with these other orders. And of course, it's also interacting with power relations. So in order to understand what, what is it that makes law, words on paper, actually lead to changes in behavior, we need to understand how it functionally does that through interactions with these other legal orders and uh, power. So to focus on functions, what we're really interested in is what does it take to get from a policy or a law to changed behavior? And what this report fo focuses on is what are, are now famous three Cs. Now this is very dangerous because if you think about it, there are many, many C words in the English language that one could substitute, and I've heard lots of different variations of this. Um, this comes from game theory um, and looks again, what we're talking about here is how actors strike bargains and how they sustain these deals. Um, so the three C's that we emphasize here that functionally are required for policies to actually change people's behavior towards uh, socially desirable behavior um, are commitment, which means effective policies have devices that guarantee a credible commitment that policies will stick over time even in the face of changing circumstances and incentives. So in short, you need enforcement mechanisms that, that bind the hands of elites so they do not renege. So thinking about this um, in terms of the context of this conference, um, what kind of commitment do you need for growth, uh, for moving to industrialization? Uh, you, need, uh, you need to create an environment in which firms or individuals feel secure in investing their resources in productive activities and that they have the incentives to use them efficiently. Property rights, um, you know, they need a commitment that they're not gonna be arbitrarily abrogated. Contract enforcement is, is likewise very important. Um, regulation affecting competition needs to be credible. Um, but to make a point here, again, picking up on Lance, um, Lance's presentation this morning, the kinds of things that can functionally produce that commitment in a given time do not need to be law. They do not need to be courts. They can be other things. Um, and there's a lot of literature that shows us the way contracts, for example, were enforced through social relations, through kinship relations, through all kinds of informal mechanisms. Now, what we also know is that there comes a point in which that's insufficient. And once an economy develops to a certain level of sophistication, it needs to move towards a rule-based system, otherwise that credible commitment is not there. But at given points in time, you can look at different, different kinds of forms that can functionally protect property rights. China did this, for example, where it didn't, before it had a system of property rights and a, and a capable judiciary, at least around certain things, um, it had a system where towns and village enterprises um, took a took a stake in the company that was operating in their area, and that served as a commitment. That served as a device to say, uh, we're not gonna abrogate your property, we're not gonna uh, annul this contract because we all stand to gain. Secondly, coordination. Effective policies have to make people coordinate by acting in complementary ways to achieve socially desirable outcomes. For growth, coordination is needed, for example, to solve market failures. 
to coordinate investment activity. Without some way of coordinating decisions of regulators, workers, and firms, industry can remain trapped in a low-level equilibrium. Coordination problems can occur in lots of different contexts, from finance to adoption of technology to innovation to moving to industrial clusters. So you need coordination to enable people to take action based on credible expectations of what others will do. You, the state can do this sometimes through subsidies, or through taxes, but the question is how does it do this in a way that is effectively able to uh, make people rely on, on expectations of what others will do so that they will then take those actions. And finally, cooperation. Effective policies have to limit deviance and free riders in order to promote public welfare. In cases of security, for example, to reduce crime, equity in order to, to um, get taxation for redistribution purposes, for fair competition, for environmental sustainability, to protect common resources, and to limit corruption. So cooperation can be induced through credible mechanisms of sanctions, like law enforcement and other penalties. But what we also know is that can be very expensive and that can be very hard to do. Um, it requires a lot of capacity for that. It also requires getting the, getting the functions right so that the cost-benefit analysis works out. So what we really want in order to uh, functionally have cooperation is to move towards voluntary compliance. And a lot of literature shows that um, voluntary compliance is related to legitimacy. It is related to the extent of people's sense of legitimacy in the institutions, in the laws, legitimacy in terms of the outcomes that they're getting, legitimacy also in terms of the process um, and how they participate in the formulation of these policies. So now, one slide. Just to show, uh, for example, um, function over form. This shows you uh, Mongolia and Chile. Um, Chile had a fiscal rule for um, dealing with macro fiscal stability um, around its natural resources. Mongolia, when it had lots of natural resources coming, said, we want the best practice, and brought all kinds of people and said, here, use Chile's rule. Well, look at the difference in the charts. Chile was at a point that it was able to, the political settlement they had in Chile post Pinochet, was actually able to commit to these kinds of rules for long-term development. In Mongolia, they were not. Um, there was such strong pressure to make short-term deals um, with the revenues that they had for purposes of clientelism and patronage and basically to hold things together that they were just not able at all to enforce the deal. Oh, sorry, to enforce the rule. So now we look at why do these functions fail? So we just talked about the functions that are actually needed. Now we know that they often fail. What accounts for failure of these functions? We call it power asymmetries in the policy arena, meaning that when your policy arena is dominated by the interests and incentives of a particular set of elites, that can undermine the ability to adopt and implement functionally effective policies. This can lead to violence, growth stagnation, failure of structural change, um, difficulty from moving from agriculture to industrialization, or um, certainly it accounts also for the middle income trap, the difficulty from moving from middle income towards different models of growth that, that require creative destruction. Now, we talk about three kinds of power asymmetries that are quite common in language that you've probably heard. Exclusion. So if key groups are systematically excluded from policy decisions that affect their interests, this can undermine commitment as well as cooperation. So when actors are excluded from the bargain, they may see a zero-sum game and opt for obstruction, which can undermine any agreement. Or worse, if they're left out of the bargain, they may believe that the only way to pursue their interests is through violence. So we explore this in particular in a chapter around security. Secondly, capture. This occurs when influential groups are able to capture policies to serve their narrow interests in ways that can often be detrimental to growth and equity. Um, so example here is energy subsidies, as we talked about, or regulatory capture. Clientelism. This is when accountability becomes transactional. You exchange goods and services for political support. And this can lead to policies that focus on the short-term and narrow interests rather than longer-term investments in the public good. So just to share with you, here, you know, we talked about who are the actors. So ha we did an elite, we did a, a survey of elites um, in countries using also data collected over 100 years um, to try to say who is it that's at the table. Um, and what you see, if you can see the slide, um, shows it's very difficult to read, but the different colors there are different segments of society, different groups, whether it's military, civil society, media, the legislature, uh, the president. And so it shows you how in different countries you have a different configuration um, of who those are, who are the elites, who are the, who are the actors around the table at any given time. 
And then on the right side just takes Brazil and shows over time how it is that the relative influence of these different actors waxes and wanes um, uh, you know, as, as things move on. Now, I want to uh, capture. Um, this is just an interesting slide, which is uh, it's hard to quantitatively um, sort of assess th this kind of capture, but um, here's a slide that looks at Indonesia. And in Indonesia in the mid-90s, um, there were a, um, a lot of the largest industrial groups had very strong connections to President Suharto. And what this graph shows is between 95 and 97, there were rumors about Suharto's health. And uh, each time, the more closely industrial groups were connected to the president, the more their stock value fell. So, and then the more serious the health rumor, the, for, the greater the fall in stock values. So this decline, you know, it was determined this was not connected to any other conditions in market or productivity. So it's a bit of a proxy for the private benefits of being able to capture policy through political connections. And then finally, just to show clientelism, how this effectively is a reversal of the principal agent relationship. Now, one thing that I want to say about these, we should not look at these as necessarily dysfunction or deviance. Um, these kinds of uh, power asymmetries, as we call them, or these, these, these symptoms of power uh, asymmetries, are there for a purpose. They are basically sustaining the deals that are made. So, um, sorry. Um, so, in other words, capture and clientelism, we can say this is bad, but you can't just eradicate it, because if you do, then the question is, what is holding the elite bargain together? Um, if effectively what is happening is capture is enabling a certain, the exercise of power through certain sorts of ways, um, then you need to ask yourself, well, what is the alternative way of being able to do this, and are the conditions for that there before you can actually get rid of capture? So now, how do we change it? This slide is a visual depiction of the report's conceptual framework. So in the middle, we have the policy arena. And what we see is a two-level game. The right side shows policies emerging from the policy arena, leading to outcomes. This is, where we, this is where we usually focus, how to make those policies right and to try to get them implemented. But the adoption and implementation of, sorry, but the adoption and implementation of policies is shaped by the second game, what we call here the rules game which is the one on the left. And sorry, every time I click this, it goes away. This is the way the rules, whether they're formal and informal, shape the policy arena by determining who is at the table and whose interests and incentives prevail. And what we argue is that we need to be paying a lot more attention to the rules game in order to maximize outcomes coming out on the right side. Now, another point about this, persistence. The literature really emphasizes persistence. And this is a very endogenous dynamic. I mean, it's effectively an, an infinity loop. Um, and the factors, that determine the nature of the policy arena are highly endogenous to a country's historical trajectory, social norms, beliefs, path dependencies, and they tend to reproduce the same kinds of asymmetries. Um, so for this reason, it's very hard to break out of the equilibrium. But you can. Uh, lots of countries have, and we try to understand what are the conditions under which you can break out of these equilibria and move from a deals-based sort of power asymmetry context to one that is more rules-based. So change happens via three key levers that change the nature of the policy arena so it can deliver on the Cs, the three Cs. It, you can change the incentives of the actors in the policy arena. You increase the reward, lower the cost of taking developmental actions. You can change their preferences via evidence, norm diffusion, different kinds of ways. You can increase the contestability of the arena, which is basically changing the, who, who's at the table. Um, might ch change the policy arena, who gets to make those decisions and the rules of the bargains. So where does this change come from? We could wait the hundreds of years that Asimoglu and Robinson tell us about, um, but we're, we're going to point to a few things um, that one can look at. You know, one is external shocks, um, internal demographic changes, development itself. Um, so what we have here in these charts is looking at Latin America. Um, and what we see on the left is that growing middle class over time changed preferences and demand. But the level of development is only part of the explanation. So what we see on the right side is a graph of corruption. So you would expect that as development occurs, um, corruption uh, is, is constrained at the same time. But what we actually see is that there are overperformers and underperformers. And this tells us that policy does matter. 
So how can change be brought about? So if we understand what are the levers of change, how do we get there? Other than waiting for external shocks and other things to happen. So we look at three agents of change. One is elite bargains. So how do elites, uh, how, do, how do agreements among decision makers to restrict their power come about? Why would elites choose to bind their own hands and move toward institutionalization of, of rules rather than deals? Well, things are happening all the time, right? They have, to, they have to be adaptive to different kinds of circumstances that are going on, whether they're fights between elites, whether it's pressure coming from below, whether it's some kind of external shock or something that is going on. So the big question is, how do elite bargains adapt to change circumstances? And unfortunately, often they don't adapt. And that accounts for the statistic that low and middle income countries experience violent transitions every eight years on average. So when they do successfully adapt, what does that look like? So there are two, two real reasons. Sorry, I'm, I'm almost finished. So there are you know, two reasons that we see from different countries as to how, what, how it is that they adapt and agree to bind their own hands. One is when it strengthens their authority in the long term. So for example, uh, to incorporate additional powerful groups into their coalition. So China, for example, at a certain point, the Communist Party of China welcomed entrepreneurs into the party. Um, and it did that because it wanted to stay in power and saw a potential threat there. Now, having done that in order to maintain themselves in power, that changed what was coming out of the policy arena, and you saw a lot more pro-business kind of things coming out of that. Um, or you can also see it change in reaction to threats from citizens. That you'll see in, in Morocco, for example, they escaped the Arab Spring because they, they anticipated and started putting some, some accommodations into place um, for citizens. The other reason that you see elite bargains um, adapt to rules-based is to provide insurance against a future loss of power. So in a competitive system, to lower the cost of losing, uh, you, you want to subject, if you think you're going to lose, you want whoever's going to be in power to be bound by rules. So this is a reason that you might actually start to agree it's in everybody's interest there to have more rules. Um, now this can happen in either sort of across the board kinds of things like that, or sometimes we see it in pockets of effectiveness where you have narrow space in which elites are incentivized to create bureaucratic effectiveness, for example, around commercial dispute resolution or particular kinds of regulations. So even when these things are done out of elite interest, the impact is to change the policy arena. And the question is, can these changes create virtuous cycles of change? Now, very quickly, um, I will just talk about citizens. Um, collective action by citizens, uh, our report looks at um, four mechanisms through which citizens um, can engage in the policy arena through voting, through political parties, through social movements, and through participation. And basically, none of them are perfect. Um, there needs to be sort of some combination of these in order for citizens to actually have the kind of collective action that can engage and change elitist incentives. And the last one, which I don't have time to talk about, <laughs> is the role of international influence. But maybe in questions, I can, I can talk about that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Deborah. I really have to apologize because lunch took long and we don't have much time. Uh, what I can say maybe before Professor Lars Osberg uh, just contribute also very briefly, I'll be even brutal with Lars than, than Deborah, uh, is that maybe we also need another time to have more extensive discussion here. Maybe Repoa, Steve, and Yutaka, you're here. We can have another time because this report is very important, Lars. Ah, thanks, sir. thanks very much. Uh, so I'll try to speak a little bit quickly. Uh, I found this a, a, a really interesting document uh, to read. There are, there are lots of very reasonable sounding statements. Uh, it has a huge sweep to it. It covers politics, economics, uh, sociology. Uh, not history, but uh, all the current social sciences. Uh, there are lots of examples which sound reasonable to me. Uh, capsule histories within a par paragraph or so, but uh, sometimes I don't really know enough about the situation, but I found it odd reading, uh, and I think that's partly because of the authorship. Uh, I, I mean, if I write, uh, write something, uh, it, it may be that some of you find it reasonable, some of you find it unreasonable, but you, you know and I know that I am not lending billions of dollars a year around the world. I, I am not one of the world's most powerful institutions in a globalized world. But the World Bank is. And so when the World Bank makes an official statement, which has gone through many, 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 many committees, I'm sure, then it has to know 
that the statement is going to be scanned for its meaning. And that people who are looking to the World Bank for, for resources are going to think, well, what does this mean about how I should spin things uh, next time out? Uh, so the question you might ask yourself is, what's, there, there's got to be a subtext in, ter in terms of what messages uh, are, are intended. I mean, some of my colleagues think that, uh, that, that this document is a, is a real step forward, and in one sense I, I'd agree, uh, in that it is a, it's a step backwards uh, from uh, market funda fundamentalism. Uh, the idea that, you know, the first best theorem of welfare economics tells you what you want to do in all circumstances, and we'll just go with that. Um, but the question really is then, what step is, is it towards? And that's a bit more unclear. And, and one of my problems with, with reading the document is, is the kind of the, the what, what, uh, sort of a back and forth between positive and normative analysis. Uh, let me quote directly. The analysis in this report starts from the normative statement that every society cares about freeing its members from the constant threat of violence, security, about promoting prosperity, growth, and about how such prosperity is shared equity. It also assumes that societies aspire to achieving the, these goals in environmentally sustainable ways. Now, th there isn't a should in there. I mean, perhaps it's true, I think it certainly is true, that societies, nations, countries should aspire to these goals, but is it actually an empirically, objectively true statement that all countries at all points in time have in fact acted as if they uh, want these objectives uh, within, their, uh, within their boundaries? And so in that sense, it, it can't be an entirely positive statement, but as a, as a normative statement about the objectives of, of policy, well, it's, it's kind of a minimalist, objective, isn't it? I mean, you could, one way of thinking about it is how far have our aspirations uh, uh, dropped in the last 70 years? In 1948, the UN wrote, wrote its Universal Direct Declaration of Human Rights, which talked in great detail about both social and political rights uh, and, and economic rights as well, legal and, and political and social and economic rights. And there's a whole tradition of humans, human rights covenants around the world, which have quite detailed implications for what governments should do uh, at any point in, in time. But we've, we've backed uh, away from, from, from that. And if, if we're going to talk about what uh, governments uh, uh, do do, well, global governance is, is one thing. We should at least be on the agenda in, in some way. I mean, the, the, the report defines governance as the process through which the state of, of uh, non-state actors interact to design and implement policies within a given set of formal and informal rules that shape and are shaped by power. And we're talking to, in this workshop about industrialization-led uh, development. And some of us come from Tanzania and from other developing countries, and some come from uh, developed countries. And when developed countries in industrialized, they didn't have anywhere near the same set of rules for governing international trade as, as are present today. Uh, my country, uh, Canada, for, for example, uh, wouldn't exist as a national marketplace without the protective tariffs which from 1878 on uh, created a, a national economic space and in some senses a, a national uh, political community. Uh, Canada rejected quite explicitly free trade with the United States in the early 1900s. It's only re quite recently that uh, Canada has gone to a, 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 the, the current uh, standard model of uh, free trade agreements and, and low, uh, low national tariffs. And so the institutional environment which created an, or an, at least enabled a Canadian industrialization is completely different uh, from the sort of institutional environment which developing countries t today face and which, is, which are to a certain extent enforced um, by international organizations uh, around the world. So if we think about uh, th what this report can tell us uh, about, about de development, uh, I'm surprised that, that there isn't any in, engagement with, with the, sort of the, the political economy uh, literature which talks about the, the interests uh, which are, are served by, uh, by the, the institutions of, of global governance. Uh, 
uh, the institutions that, uh, that prevent uh, particular policy in, in, in innovations. Uh, you know, the U.S. Uh, copied technology from the, from the U.K., the Jap Japan copied uh, technology from, from everywhere, uh, so, so did China, but today's free trade agreements have a large uh, pr in protection of intellectual property uh, laws, which are built into them. So in this, but in this uh, analysis, I can see he's getting ready for me, uh, but I'm, I'm going to, so I'm going to hear, hear, in this analysis, it's kind of ahistorical, and it falls in the tradition of the uh, cross-country growth regression uh, type literature, where each individual country is taken as just another observation uh, on a general process. There's no sense of the embeddedness uh, of countries within relationships or the extent to which they're uh, affected um, by others. Um, and in that uh, sense, uh, and there's also uh, no real, the, 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 well, it's, it's not quite true to say that the uh, concept of uh, elite is, is unclear in this document. It's just that it's a very different concept of elite than which w what we norm, uh, normally think, uh, many people have learned to think about it. About it. Uh, the, the concept of elite, uh, I mean, many people may have grown up with the idea uh, that uh, rich people matter uh, and that the, the capitalist class uh, matters, it has power, and partly has power in a way that it, in the, in the most powerful sense, uh, that it pays everybody else to anticipate their demands, and so they don't actually have to, uh, the, 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 the string pullers don't actually have to pull the strings very often, um, but they just have to w watch people uh, look, for their, look for their signals. Uh, but, but that's not part of the way elites are defined here. We saw a nice uh, graphic here in which uh, I, I'm not quite sure uh, what, what, what each of those little uh, components of the elite are, uh, but none of them uh, fit with categories uh, li like uh, multinational corporations. In fact, I could, didn't hear the word multinational corporations anywhere in, in, the, in, the, in the discussion. So in terms of wh who's powerful and who's not, who's an elite and who's not, I mean, I, there's a bunch of, of, of the discussion in the document which I, f I find hard uh, uh, to, to recognize. So in the, in the end, uh, I think it's a really interesting report, and, uh, and it, but it's a report that, that's about power, but it doesn't mention some of the most powerful institutions in the world. It's a, a, a book that's about uh, governance, but it doesn't mention global governance. And I'm not quite sure how you talk about local governance without also mentioning the global governance which informs and constrains that which is possible at, at the local level. Uh, so perhaps that'll be part of the next World Development Report, but I'm not holding my breath. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor. Thank you, Blandina. Oh, thank you very much. A big round of applause, please.